phone or whatever device you have with you, I'm going to be reading again from 2 Kings. We're in chapter 6. Now I'm continuing to work my way through the, the life of Elisha. We looked at the life of Elijah first, and then the mantle was passed over to Elisha. So I want to continue on with that today. 2 Kings chapter 6, starting at verse 1. If you don't have your Bibles or your uh, phone with you, you can look at the screen, and if you're watching online, it'll be on, on the screen as well. The company of the prophets said to Elisha, Look, the place where we meet with you is too small for us. Let us go to the Jordan, where each of us can get a pole, and let us build a place there for us to meet. And he said, Go. Then one of them said, Won't you please come with your servants? I will, Elisha replied. And he went with them. They went to the Jordan and began to cut down trees. As one of them was cutting down a tree, the iron axe head fell into the water. Oh no, my lord, he cried out. It was borrowed. The man of God asked, Where did it fall? When he showed him the place, Elisha cut a stick, threw it in there, and made the iron float. Lift it out, he said. The man reached out his hand and took it. May God bless the reading of his word. Again, welcome to everyone that's here in church. We're glad that you're here with us. Welcome to everyone that's watching online. We're glad that you can be a part with us digitally. Uh, I don't know how, the, how all the technology works, but we're glad that you're able to to join us. And if you're watching on Facebook, hit the, hit the like or share button and please send us a comment. Let us know that you're, you're listening, that you're a part of us today. We love to hear your comments. And there are people that will comment even during the message. If by some strange chance I might possibly ever make a mistake, it's funny the comments that we will get on Facebook, they'll, we'll see some smiles and some laughs that come back. But let us know your comments. But here at Crown Alliance Church, we want to invite people to come, grow, and go. We want people to come so they can hear the good news of Jesus. We want them to grow by understanding a little bit more, kind of like I'm gonna, I've been doing in this series. I want to unpack these stories a little bit so we can learn a little bit more how awesome God is. That's the grow part. And then the go, when we leave this place, that we can go out of here and be able to be a witness and a testimony to people and I don't know about you, but I, I know several people that struggle with many things, and some even more during this holiday season. So as you go, may you take the good news of Jesus with you. Before I pray, I just want to start with a word of prayer. God, we thank you for the opportunity to be here today. We are blessed and privileged especially in this country, to have the ability to be able to freely go to whatever place we want to to worship. We are free to express our love for the God that we serve. And Lord, we thank you for that. I thank you for all that you've done for us. I thank you for all the ways that you've blessed us individually. You've blessed us as a church. Lord, we owe you so much praise and give you so much glory for all that you've done for us. But Lord, there are also so many needs that we face. There are some here today that are dealing with physical needs. There are some that have family members that are going through difficult times. Lord, we pray for those. There are those here that are struggling financially. There are those here that are struggling emotionally. There may be marriages that are struggling, relationships that are struggling, kids that are struggling with the pressures of being in school. But Lord, all these, we come to you knowing that you're a God that loves us and cares for us and desires to be there for us. Lord, we pray for our country. I pray that we would be one nation under God, that we would be seeking you for guidance and direction, and that we would be basing our decisions on our love for you and on our looking into your word to understand how we should live our lives better. Lord, we thank you again for this church, and I thank you for everyone that faithfully supports this church through their giving. Lord, I pray that every penny that is given would be taken, blessed, and used to advance the kingdom of God evermore. Lord, be with us today in all that we do and all that we say, and be with me as I try to share some, some insights from the word, and hopefully it will help each one of us this next week. In your name we pray, amen and amen. 
Now, for all the parents listening today, you, you might be able to relate to this illustration. Uh, how happy were you when your kids were finally able to do some of the things on their own? I remember when my two kids were young, just the, the simple feat of getting all four of us out to the car to go anywhere was a, was a huge effort. Tying shoes, shoes are on, then shoes are kicked off. Putting coats on, finding coats that are lost. All these things, and mom and dad had to do them for the kids. It, it's wonderful when the kids were finally able to, to do, do some things on their own. Now, I have to admit, I used to cringe sometimes when my kids would dress themselves. Might not be the combination of clothes that I would have picked, but the fact that they did it was a good thing. The older I got as a kid, I started to realize that there are things that I really didn't need to bother my parents with anymore. I, I could do them myself. The ironic thing with that is, as a parent, we want to take care of our kids. We want to do those things. But it is a lot of work. But I, I think I can transfer that over to the way we decide on the things that we should pray about. Now, we have no problem going to God when there's a huge need, when there's a big financial need, when there's a big health need, there's something going on. We pray, and we pray hard. We pray often. We pray a lot about that. But then there's times it's kind of like we evaluate in our heads, well, I don't really know if I want to bother God with this one. This is just a little thing. Do I really need to bother him? But the reality is God is just as concerned about the little things as he is the big things. He cares. It's like the parent that wants to button their kids up. Uh, and, and we're coming into the winter time, and I always think of the, the movie, you know, or movies that you see. Mother dresses up their kids in the snowmobile suit, and the poor kid can't move. He's walking around like this because he's so bundled up, but you, you love your kid, and you want to take care of him. I, I want to suggest today that God loves us, and wants to take care of us, even in the little things. But as I was thinking this, I was reminded of a time where a bunch of us in my home church in Valley View Alliance in Vestal, we went out sled riding and we, we called ourselves the College and Career Group. That was a fancy name. It sounded real professional, but all it really meant was we were too old to be in senior high and we were definitely too young to be with the old people in real church. So we, we did things on our own. We called ourselves a college and career group. I don't think there was a one of us that was going to college. The beauty was we were young, we were working jobs, so we had all the money to do whatever we wanted to. So that was our college and career group. And we were out sled riding one time, and we were going up and down this hill dozens of times. I don't even know how long we'd been there. And then all of a sudden, one of the girls that was with us says, oh no, my keys fell out of my pocket. So we're looking up and down this hill, trying to find these keys. We had been up and down that hill dozens of times, knew the reality was they could have been mashed under snow and been slid over dozens of times. So we're looking up and down this hill, and then all of a sudden one of the girls, actually the girl that lost the keys, she goes, wait a minute, we're a church group. Why don't we pray and ask God to help us find the keys? And we looked at each other with a collective silent duh, Never thought about that. Why don't we do that? So it was really cool. I don't, if anybody would have been watching us, they would have wondered what's going on. We're just walking all over this hill instead of sled riding anymore. Then all of a sudden we stop and we bow our heads and we pray a silly thing like finding keys. I mean, we have no problem praying for, for God to hear cancer because we don't believe that's a problem. God can take care of that. But it's like, Keys? It's funny. Guess what? We prayed, and shortly after that, we found the car keys. But do we even think to pray about something little like that? Today I want to talk about a story that I would kind of compare to that finding the keys event. Those lost keys weren't a life and death 
emergency. Even if we hadn't found the keys, I'm reasonably sure our bodies would not have been found four days later frozen dead on the side of that, that hill that was right in the middle of the city. I mean, there was no danger. We, it, it wasn't a big thing. But God cared about finding those keys. In the text that I read this morning, the lost axe head, it was an issue, but it really wasn't a life and death issue. So the first question I ask is, why do we have this story in the Bible? You know, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not critiquing God or the, the authorship of the Bible, but why do we have this? A lost axe head. Does it, in the grand scheme of things, does it really matter? Is this an event that yeah, we could have done without? Really didn't need to be there. But the more I thought about it, the more I realized it really does highlight an attribute of God that sometimes I think we overlook. In the middle of everything that Elisha was dealing with, in, in the middle of everything that the nation of Israel had going on at the time, they were in spiritual decline. Morally, things were falling apart. There were threats of foreign nations. They were going through seven years of famine. I've already talked about that part of the story. Elisha was involved with raising a boy from the dead. Those are pretty major things that were going on. And now we have a lost keys event, an, an axe head that falls off. But in the middle of all that big stuff, God took care of a small personal need for one of his children. Because he cares. Because he loves. Because he wants to. All right, like, okay, this, this story is starting to click in my head now. It's starting to make sense. It is important. There's a reason it's there. Folks, whenever you're, whatever you're dealing with in life, I want you to know God cares deeply about it. When I pray, I go through a list of things that could possibly be happening. There's physical needs. There's all these needs that are going on. Don't ever forget. That God personally cares for the very things that you are thinking of. Don't worry about the person sitting next to you. God cares about your needs. God cares about my needs. Big, little, it doesn't matter. God cares. Before I get into all the details of the story, I have to admit there's something that I, I never noticed before. And it's interesting, I, ever since I got into ministry, I made it a habit of reading through the Bible once every year. And I have a list of the years that I did it. I have a list of the translations that I've used and all this. And I am amazed every year. It's like I find something, like, I must have missed that verse. I, 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 never, I don't even remember this before. Something new clicks to me. And when people say they, the Bible is boring... I don't mean to be rude, but y'all ain't reading it right. There's a lot of good stuff in there. But do we really take time to pull it out? But this is one of those areas that I have to admit never really clicked to me before. During all those difficult times that I mentioned, God was still on the move. And we're going to see this in, in the first verse that I'm going to talk about. But if you've been following me through the series, you've probably heard me mention about the spiritual decline that the Israelites in. They were messing everything up. Um, I, I always tell people, I have the gift and ability to mess up a free lunch. And the Israelites were that way. Everything could be laid out before God for them. And they would still make wrong choices. One of the main reasons God kept sending prophets like Elijah and Elisha was because the Israelites were in desperate need. But the fact that I always overlooked was that they were chopping down trees because they were in the middle of a building program. They were in the middle of a building program. 
There were so many prophets in training that they needed a bigger building. Let me read verse 1 again. The company of the prophets said to Elisha, Look, the place where we meet with you is too small for us. I'm thinking, wait a minute. One of the biggest struggles that they're having is spiritual apathy. They're, they're pulling away from God. They're, they're not living the way they should. But now we're told in this verse that the seminary, if you would, the training place for these up-and-coming prophets wasn't big enough. Folks, even when we think things are going horribly, God's still in control. Isn't that cool? Every, we could look at it and say, man, they were, they were a bunch of fools. They were messing everything up. They were falling away from God. But then we hear in this verse, there's not enough room for them. They need to build a bigger place. How many times do we get so caught up in the evil that goes on in the world? Now, now let me stop before I finish that statement. Can you think of a conversation you've had, let's say, the last three or four years have you in the last three or four years have you ever had a conversation where you're like oh wow the world's messed up i had to go back three years because i mean it probably can take that long to think of something that's went wrong in this world the world's messed up but in that we get so caught up in talking about how messed up the world is that we forget that satan was defeated on the cross and god is still in control Every time we partake in communion, God is still in control. Yeah, the world's messed up. And, and, and if you want to talk about it, uh, you know, buy me a cup of coffee and we'll sit down. We'll, we can have talk on how the world's messed up. Only if you let me remind you that God is still in control. Don't get so caught up in what's going on. But then there's a couple other side notes that I wanted to point out about this story. Probably not the main issues. But I think we can miss them easily. The first one comes from the fact that Elisha was there. He was the leader of this seminary. He was a leader of the company of the prophets. But he was right there with them during this building program. They came to him and said, listen, Elisha, dude, we, we need a bigger building. We need more space. We got to go cut trees so we can build a bigger building. But then they said, will you come with us? And Elisha says, I'm right there. Side by side, working with him. He was, the, he was the big cheese. He was the high mucky muck of prophets. Yet he was right there in the middle of chopping down trees, doing what needs to be done. I, I think I've mentioned this before. When I was in Bible college, I had the opportunity to pastor a little country church while I was in Bible college. But the first duty that I had after accepting the position as pastor is they had a work day. At the church, the first duty that I did as their new pastor is I painted the outhouse. Oh, I'm really advancing. I mean, I'm, I'm doing these great things. I'm moving up. I'm now a pastor. And here I'm in the middle of an outhouse. And there are senses that you experience inside an outhouse. I'm not going to go into detail, but you can let your mind wander. And there I am painting. But you know what? I was proud to do it. Because I'm serving God, working in the church. Elisha was there. He could have said, man, I, I got too much to do. We're going to hire somebody in to do this work. The second side note of this story is the students were doing the work. No matter what our position is, when it comes to working for God, we all should put our shoulder to the plow. We all should be willing to do the work that God wants us to do. The students can say, I, I, there's so much I need to learn. I have to spend my time studying. I, <laughs> I don't know if I can say this right. I don't know if it's possible to say this right. But I'm glad I'm not a monk. You know, I enjoy studying and learning. But I really don't want to put on a brown robe, go up in the mountains and hide in a room and sit there and study 24 hours a day. I don't want to do that. These prophets in training didn't do that. They were working. They were hard at doing what needs to be done. That reminds me of another verse in the New Testament. 2 Thessalonians 3 verse 10. The one who is unwilling to work shall not eat. Pretty good philosophy. 
be willing to work. Elisha was there. He was a part of it. The students in training were there. They were working, doing what needs to be done. Now, we kind of want to Google who can do the, the work for us that we want done. Do it cheap, of course, because we don't want to pay anybody. But we certainly don't want to do the work ourselves. In the last chapter, I mentioned that Elisha's servant, Gehazi, was stricken with leprosy because he tried to get something for nothing. Ah, oh, man, my boss was silly. He didn't take advantage. He could have gotten money out of Naaman after, after God healed Naaman from his, his leprosy. So he tries to work out this deal where he can get a little coin in his pocket. And when you see how God responded to that, God struck him with leprosy because he was trying to get something for nothing. Here we're going to see that God will provide for one of the people that is willing to work. This guy was out working hard so he could continue his ministry and God was going to bless him. And I think it's through side notes like these that we can learn a lot about God. Are they big parts of the story? I guess it depends on the way you look at it. I think they are big parts of the story. God wants to do a lot of things for us. Are we willing to be in the game? As, as the saying goes, do we have skin in the game? Are, are we doing what God wants us to do? Denise and I have talked many times. We both can give examples of times where we knew we had an opportunity to witness to somebody. And we didn't. We let it slip by. Are we willing to do the work that God wants us to do? The more time I spend reading the Bible, the more I keep learning from it. Each story has a lot more to tell us if we really take time to read it. Okay, that was my, my side note. Now back to the story. But let's keep looking at this story and see what we can learn from it. They're out getting lumber to build their new school. They're chopping away. I mean, he, and I don't know, I... As pastors, we get together and we joke about a lot of things. One of my good friends said, he has no skills. He said if he ever lost his pastoring position, he would have no idea what to do because that's all he's ever done is pastor. I have the, fortunately I have the trade of truck driving, so I could do something. But I'm thinking these poor prophets in training. I mean, I don't even know if they knew which end of the axe to hold, but they're out there working as hard as they can, trying to cut down these trees to get the, the job done. But remember, they're seminary students, not lumberjacks. A lumberjack is going to know to keep your axe sharp and to keep it well-maintained. I, I love the story of my little nephew. There was an old tree beside the house, and he was going to chop it down. And my mom happened to be there, so she made a deal. I'll give you 20 bucks if you chop that tree down. And my nephew was, I mean, he was small at the time. I, I don't, maybe five years old, six years old. So 20 bucks to him was a big thing. So he was out there and he was chopping away at this tree and he got it. It was down. <laughs> the real funny part of the story is about 15 years later, my brother's telling the story and he goes, I didn't have the heart to tell him that his axe was dull. I mean, the poor, kid, the poor kid's wailing away on this tree with the dull axe. So I, I don't know if it was this guy's fault or not. I don't know if the axe was sharp or dull. I don't know if the axe was not maintained well or not. But anyway, the axe head flew off. And we can read his reaction when that happened in verse 5. Oh, no, my Lord, he cried. It was borrowed. There's a couple things that I want to take just from that little statement there. The first was based on the fact that it's, there's a lowercase l in there. He wasn't crying out to God. He was simply crying out to Elisha. Oh, no. My Lord is a term that would represent Elisha in his position of authority. He's like, oh, no, Elisha, well, what am I going to do? But then the second part is the fact that he lost someone else's property. Now, as a truck driver, I've been both a company driver where I drive a company vehicle or I've been an owner operator where I own the truck 
and then I work for somebody else. Now, it's interesting. I've met some company drivers that could care less how they take care of their vehicle. It's the company. I don't need to pay for it. What's the expression? Drive it like you stole it? I don't care. Do whatever you want. I have always tried to take as good of care as a company of a company vehicle as if it was my own. I, I, I feel like I have that respect that I need to do that. Once again, our faith and our respect for God and others should be seen through the ways we live out our daily lives. When I talk about the come, grow, and go, this falls under the go part. I've said this before. If you ever stopped in the middle of work and stopped all the people around you, said, wait a minute, I want to make an announcement. I want you to know that I'm a Christian. How many people would pass out? <laughs> Never saw that coming. Do we live our life in a way that demonstrates that we love the Lord? So, Zach's head flies off, and at that time, an axe head probably was a fairly expensive tool. It's obvious the prophet in training didn't have money because he had to borrow it in the first place. But he also had the integrity to know that he was responsible because he had borrowed it from someone else. So, oh my Lord, it was borrowed. But then I want to look at Elisha's response in verses 6 and 7. The man of God asked him, where did it fall? When he showed him the place, Elisha cut a stick and threw it there and made the iron float. And I, I love that. I read that real quick and you just kind of go over those words. A chunk of iron floated to... Are you, are you tracking with me here? A chunk of iron floated to the top of the water. Lift it out, he said. The man reached out his hand and took it. Immediately, as soon as Elisha heard that, he heard the desperation in that man's voice. Oh no, my Lord, it was borrowed. He, he felt that. He empathized with that person. We can't be so consumed with our own issues that we fail to see the needs of others. Back to the parent analogy. Doesn't necessarily matter what's going on in the parent's life. If the kid needs something, you do it. Parents will sacrifice because their kids need our help. Do we have compassion for other people to take time to enter into their needs, enter into their garden of pain, enter into their struggle, we should. But Elisha knew that the God that he served would also be concerned about that man who lost a borrowed axe head. So Elisha's hearing this. He's putting it all together. I, I feel that man's pain, but then he takes the next step. I know God wants to help that person as well. Now, there is nowhere in Scripture that tells us God told Elisha what to do. We're not told that God said, hey, go get a stick and do this and that. I, I don't know if he did, but I look at it this way. Elisha knew that because God cared about that man, yeah, God's going to do something. And God was going to honor the things that he did. He, Elisha acted in a way that demonstrated his faith. That God would do whatever was necessary to care for the person that was in need. Man, we should spend much more time doing what's necessary. And less time trying to determine what we think is possible. Elisha could have sat there and said, man, I can't help you. I don't have a scuba diving suit. I, I, what do you want me to do? I can't do anything. Sometimes we sit around and try, well, can, can I really even make a difference? Instead of just jumping in there and doing it. 
If nothing is impossible for God, why do we hesitate to ask? God, you know where those car keys are. Can you help us find them? God, you know where that axe head is. Can you help us find it? Elisha didn't have to search for a special stick. You didn't have to go to the right kind of tree or the, the, the Y in the branch that goes like this. Or, no, it just says he took a stick. It just simply asked, where'd that axe head fall? And threw it there. But throwing the stick wasn't the important part. Retrieving the axe head was the important part. In attempt to solve problems, sometimes we think spending money is the answer. Elisha just wanted results. Don't we tend to throw money, but oftentimes in all the wrong places, to try to solve problems that the money has absolutely nothing to do with the problem, but we throw money thinking, well, we're, we're helping, we're doing this. Elisha was just about, this man needs the axe head back. That's all that mattered. The cool thing about miracles is that they can't be fully explained. It, are you, you, you tracking with me? That's why it's called a miracle. The axe head floated. Miracle. Shouldn't happen. But often because we can't explain it, people will tend to believe that it didn't really happen. Well, I can't believe the Bible because that's not possible. Come on. How can an axe head float? That's, that's just folklore. That's just somebody talking. That's just spinning a yarn. But to me, that argument is silly. I don't know about you, but there are a lot of things that I experience that I can't explain. Now, don't get me wrong, you guys are basically a good-looking group of people, but if I asked any one of you to explain to me how your cell phone works, I'm reasonably sure you couldn't, because I have no clue how a cell phone works. But I use it every day. Can't explain it. <laughs> get myself in trouble with this one. I can't understand or explain how Denise's brain can think of 500 things at one time and make sense out of all of it. I can't explain that. But I'm amazed that I see it happen every day. It's amazing. Can't explain it. I don't understand how God created something out of nothing in six days. I don't understand how God knelt down, pushed some dirt together in the shape of a body, knelt down and breathed life into that clump of clay, and it became a living body. I don't understand it. I can't explain it. But let me tell you this. It's way easier for me to believe that there is an infinite, all-knowing, all-powerful, loving God that did that than to say just the wrong type of cosmic dust bounced together and bang, we have creation. I can't believe that. I don't have enough faith to believe that everything in life is just a dumb accident, just chance. I don't have, and I've shared this before, a book that I read, I don't have enough faith to be an atheist. I don't. If I ever meet somebody that claims to be an atheist, I really need to shake their hand and say, you have some awesome faith, because I don't believe that'll happen. It's kind of like knowing there's a hurricane coming, so I go and sit beside the junkyard because I'm hoping when the wind blows, it whips all that stuff together, and out of the other side of the hurricane comes a brand new Peterbilt truck that's just going to happen to be put together by the right things bumping together. I don't have enough faith to believe that's a miracle. How did the axe head float? I have no clue. 
But if God can make a body out of dirt, I think he can handle making an axe head flow. Because Elisha believed, and because God responded, and because the man reached out and grabbed the axe head, God's work was able to resume. Isn't that cool? They had to build a building because God was on the move. The axe head fell off. They couldn't get the wood chopped to need to build the building. Because of all that, God did it. He responded. He provided the miracle. And the work was able to go on. All of a sudden, my little story of a silly little axe head falling off has a whole lot more impact. The work that God wanted to do will be able to happen because he provided that miracle. The question is, would you or I have even thought to ask God to bring that axe head up? Everybody said, oh yeah, life stinks. Life's a bummer. Oh man. Here I go again. Murphy's Law. Anything that can go wrong is gonna. Woe is me. Walk around kicking the dirt, man, life stinks. Or say, no, my God is still in control. I have no idea how that axe head can come back. But I know my God will help it to come back. If not, he'll give me a new axe head. Do we believe that? Does our faith say we believe in God to that point that even in the little things, he's going to help? I want you to pray for the big things. I, I've said this before. Man, I, I'm not coveting and I'm not jealous. But I would have loved to have been Elijah on top of Mount Carmel. Oh, God, send down fire and burn up that sacrifice. Oh, that would have been awesome. But do I believe that same God is the God that said, there's the keys that you need to get home. There's the ax head. I'll bring it up for you. Do we believe that God loves us and really cares? I want you to understand that God will be there in the little things as much as he is in the big things. Pray. Ask God for help. Wisdom guidance, direction. And it has to be more than my, I I would call it my high school prayers. You know the ones when you were in school and you have a big test and you didn't study at all and then you pray, God, help me to remember this. No, 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 We, we need to do the study. We need to do our part. But then pray, oh God, you work. Elisha was there. The students were willing to be to work cutting down the trees. And because of all that, God blessed. I've seen many people in my day that have gotten mad because God didn't answer their prayer in the time of need. But they lived their whole life rejecting God, not wanting any part to do with God. But then when he doesn't come through in the pinch, they're mad at God. Elisha had skin in the game. The servant, the the student had skin in the game. And God provided because they were being faithful. I I want to challenge you to pray. But I want to challenge you to be faithful first. Simple little story. Doesn't take up much space in the Bible. But I think it tells us some deep truths about how awesome God is and how much we need to look to him for help. Let's pray. God, I thank you for these little stories that reveal so much big truth about you. Lord, you are a God that loves us and cares for us. You want to help us find our keys and you want to help us find the ax heads that we've lost. You want to help us with the the little struggles we face in our life and you want to help us with the major life-threatening 
situations we deal with. Lord, I pray that we would be faithful in looking to you for the big things, but also looking to you for the small things. Lord, dismiss us now with your power. May, us, may we go out with your presence and sense your leading and guiding throughout this whole entire week. In your name we pray. Amen.